Good evening, everyone. It's a really great honor to be here. You know, the, the film that we just saw reminds us of just how powerful it is to tell your story. Many survivors actually come to the point of being able to tell and some to write their stories after decades of not being able to, sometimes more than half a century, as we just saw, of not being able to actually share their stories. I'm, at, I'm reminded of something I heard a survivor once say about the act of telling, the act of sharing, and, and in his case it was writing, and it was that in doing it, he had undergone a second liberation. The knowledge that his story had been saved and would live on allowed him to feel truly free to be liberated for a second time. And I think that what we saw with Joe Mandel was, who was indeed also, he felt, twice liberated. The second time, although it was so meaningful uh, to him to meet the soldier, in fact, the second liberation didn't come from meeting him. It came from his own act of telling and sharing. And in this way, the act of storytelling is in some ways an act of self-liberation, an act of freeing oneself of what the poet Maya Angelou called the agony of bearing an untold story inside you. The act, um, the, the act of storytelling as an act of liberation, it actually goes beyond the self. It goes beyond the self because it touches the listener, it touches the reader. When you listen to a witness, you become a witness, as the title of this exhibit tells us. The telling and the listening, the writing and the reading are reciprocal acts. And listening is not passive, it is a call to action. Ladies and gentlemen, the conviction that has guided us at the Azraeli Foundation for the last eight years, during which time we have collected over 170 survivor manuscripts and diaries, and we've published 40 books, that conviction is the same that acts as a guiding light to the March of the Living, that each survivor has a unique story to tell, that each in its own way can play a seminal role in education about tolerance and the acceptance of diversity. You know, I remember when we first embarked on this publishing project that the response we got was occasionally a little mixed. Not, not mixed to the importance of transmitting and preserving memory, of course, but there was an assumption that it would be quite depressing. And I think this is sometimes the way people feel, uh, may also feel first um, about the march. They may think it's going to be depressing and depleting. And it isn't. The stories are often difficult, and they are always emotionally powerful and challenging. Um, you know, it's a stretch. It's a stretch for the human mind to take in a world of total moral collapse. But what we find, and what all the participants on the march find, is that the stories are also filled with hope, with resilience, with courage, and with humor. It's striking that there is rarely any hate in the memoirs we publish, and tales of hate and revenge are not what survivor participants recount on the march. This is a point, actually, that is brought home to me today as I was walking around. Uh, the March of the Living participant, Nate Leipziger, who is presented here in, uh, in the exhibit, says there is a difference between hating and holding responsible. Hate will destroy the person doing the hating. The stories told and written by survivors are so powerful in that they bring history to life. When you hear or read a story, you somehow become a part of it. You place yourself in the shoes, the mind, the heart of the person in the story. The stories build a critical bridge of empathy, an experiential bridge between and across generations. And this bridge is at the heart of how the telling the story, of how listening to a witness becomes a reciprocal act. How listening not only makes you a witness yourself, but is a call to action. We see this on the march time and again, and also in the stories we publish and the educational programs we run. In fact, 
There's always a moment in each of the diverse stories where the survivor recounts that someone did something that helped them at a critical moment. It underscores the point that no one survived the Holocaust unless someone other than the survivor at some critical point did something to help the survivor. And what they did almost doesn't matter. It could vary widely. It could be a piece of bread at a critical moment. It could be a hiding place. It could be quite simply the advice to go in one direction instead of another direction at a critical moment. But when that moment came, someone had to make a choice to do something and they did. This moment when uh, someone made a choice to act is invariably the moment that readers and listeners are most drawn to. It's the one that they most remember. I think it's because it's impossible not to question why and how that person made that choice and to reflect on what you may have done under similar circumstances. The stories shared by survivors inspire listeners and readers to reflect on actions, not only of the people in the stories, but their own. When you listen to a witness, you become a witness, and the act of witnessing inspires action. Often simply in that the sharing of stories brings the realization that small acts can make a difference. In small or big ways, nearly everyone who goes on the march is inspired to repair the world, tikkun olam, to understand and remember the rip in the fabric in human history that was the Holocaust, and to work in whatever way they can to repair it through acts that promote tolerance and the dignity of every human being. Many of us have heard the line from Mishnah that says, he who saves a life, it is as if he saves the entire world. But there is also a Hasidic idea that when you tell a story, that itself can save the world. When you tell a story, it can save the world. For me, this is because sharing the story can save the memory of a person. And in keeping a memory alive, you also prevent a kind of second death, the death that comes when a person or event is forgotten. As we witness survivor stories, we are conscious of a terrible weight. The knowledge that there are millions of stories of millions of victims that can never be told. So the stories shared, witnessed, the active listening offer not only a second liberation to the survivors, but they prevent a second death to the victims. Active listening, actively working to repair the world now, in the present day, is the most powerful memorial of all. The stories and the survivors who tell them, and the li listeners and witnesses to them, save the world anew by engaging, by acting, by taking new lessons from them. I want to acknowledge and thank the leadership of the United Nations, the members of the diplomatic community here, the organizers of the March of the Living, and the board of directors of the Azraeli Foundation. But I would like to especially recognize Ellie Rubenstein for the extraordinary he work he does day in, day out, to make the March of the Living a reality, sharing the stories of survivors, and inspiring thousands of people to action. Thank you.